is, of course, painting. The others were poetry. So some scholars chose to dig deeper into poetry. Some scholars chose to dig deeper into dance and created um, dance performances of their own. Some scholars also um, really were really drawn to digital media. And so they actually chose to make a video that um, highlighted the Harlem Renaissance. So I'm going to stop just for a moment. The murals will stay here, but I'm going to ask Tracy um, if we can turn on the video, I want to show you uh, just a quick two-minute video that our TVM scholars made to give you a highlight of what the Harlem Renaissance was about, what they learned, who they studied. We made the video because we wanted to highlight the significance of the Harlem Renaissance and celebrate those who contributed. Join us on this little journey as we focus on the creative poets, singers, painters, and musicians giving you a glimpse of art. Um, a video that was made by about five of our CCMS scholars and mm. they each chose how, how they wanted to do uh, what they wanted to do and use some of the uh, tools that we found um, around school and as around the internet so um, I would be remiss to say that you know this is uh, a project that I did alone this was definitely it took a village um, some of the people that helped us of course were the TVM scholars but then we had parents who came in and supported us Natalie McBride was actually the um, resident artist who helped the scholars to paint both of these murals and she came for about six weeks and donated her time as well as her talent and um, she being an artist herself I, I guess I didn't say that part um, really helped them to get granular about ways and techniques th uh, that we can use uh, for creating a mural in addition, um, as we were doing the work, as, as was mentioned, ACOE was looking for art and art that told a story around um, having courageous conversations. And so uh, as Luis asked around, I definitely raised our hand and said we would love to present. So this art was hanging up at ACOE for about three months from June, uh, from about April until June. And then in addition, um, our scholars, Sydney and some other scholars, are, uh, presented to teachers over the summer at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Um, and so I'm going to allow Sydney to kind of come up and talk about what this unit uh, meant to her, what um, the Village Method has meant to her, as well as um, some of the things that she has done over the summer in addition to presenting to teachers. Hi, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Sydney. I'm TVM's intern now, but I've been TVM's scholar for five years. Um, right now, I'm have, last year I helped the scholars with a dance performance that I choreographed with Freedom and also the song Way in the Water. And so that helped 
us and as a community of a black community to get gain each other trust and actually um, earn each other and learn by each other's strengths and weaknesses and we use them in our performances to make it even better than we already received it as one performance. Um, this summer I went to Haiti with Ms. Mahaya and two other original TVM, TVM scholars and that was a life changing experience. It, for me, it changed how I see the world because some we might be privileged here, but we're not always privileged everywhere else as a black community. So that's also one thing that I see pleasant TVM because they also helped me go out the country for the first time that I've ever been. Um, Ms. Mejia and Ms. Mark helped me with a lot for the past five years. Sixth grade year, they met me in the office. I was a trouble child, I think you can say. But they helped me with who I can become and be a better me. Um, they helped me change me in a way that it made me better as a student and also as a person. They they love me like they're my own parent. And they love all their TVM scholars like they're their own. And so it's like they they put everything they got into us and it's like I want to help them back and so we all can be stay together in a way that all the students in my eyes need it. We, we did a lot together. We did Freedom. It was, um, that was an inspiring dance for black culture. We also did some other kind of artwork. Um, we did my friend did a poet about Linson Hughes and that also changed me in the way like we not always have each other but we we always can have each other and not it's not always optional to see each other every day but knowing we have TVM to see each other is going to help thank you thank you thank you So we just want to thank you again for all the support that you offer to our TVM family, to our scholars, to the families that are represented by the scholars. Um, it's definitely, as Sydney said, um, a work of love that we do this. And uh, it's beautiful that we are going to have the opportunity to see what the scholars produced in hanging in the hallways here at the district offices. Um, and we you know, definitely encourage you, if you haven't been by, to visit us. We, we have open doors, and we'd love to have you come stop by. We have a site at IVCMS and a site at CCMS. In addition, we um, support our, our scholars through high school out in the community um, through our community work. So I believe that's all. And we invite you also uh, January 11th to join us for our Courageous Conversations along with Glenn Singleton, um, which will be happening as we dig deeper into conversations around race and equity and thinking about the data around black youth and um, our black community throughout Southern Alameda County, January 11th. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can, can I ask one question? Any, any comments from the board yeah, members? I was uh, going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, I, I am really fascinated by the pictures. Uh, can you tell us something very brief? I know you have limited time, but I'd like to know, uh, I, I could guess, but I want to know what you want to say about each one of them, because I'm so impressed by this wonderful artwork. Excuse me one minute. Could somebody stop the phone, please? Especially uh, Ella Fitzgerald is playing on this one. <laughs> I love her. So um, the artwork represents two uh, ideas that we were sharing. So this is called Titled the South, and this um, was created by IVCMS scholars to articulate and illustrate what was going on in terms of um, oppression, in terms of some of the, the things that uh, they were living through. So in the left-hand corner on the bottom, you see that they created cotton fields that um, really were a, a huge part of, of um, what we are trying to escape in the South by way of uh, Jim Crow South, segregation, um, sharecropping, and not being paid fair wages, to put it shortly and to put it very, very loosely. Um, 
from the left corner, you move over to the right, and you have um, the scholars created a courthouse down at the bottom, and that was to articulate what was going on in terms of uh, court cases that were not favorable of fair treatment. At the bottom, you also see that there are some youth, and they were, this whole work was modeled after Jacob Lawrence's work, who was an artist of, of the Harlem Renaissance, or he studied the Harlem Renaissance and did a lot to articulate art around the Harlem Renaissance. So those were actually three figures that represent his artwork, and they are youth who are um, supposed to be in a schoolhouse. And if you go up, you see the train, and the train was a, a very large part of the Great Migration, as um, a lot of times families had to leave by train and had to almost escape by train secretly at night um, in order to not be stopped by uh, sharecroppers and the landlords. So all of this represents movement, and this was called from the south, and this is called to the north. So in the north, we have, uh, oh, there's a video. We have, um, this is, represents Harlem, and there were, in the north, major communities that blacks were moving towards, and that was Detroit, Harlem, and um, Chicago. And so the scholars chose to represent um, a scene from Harlem, and they did some research and found what some of the, the uh, buildings were that could be found in Harlem from the Apollo to the Savoy Ballroom. They also represented a, a library as learning was a, a large part of the Renaissance and a reawakening of the mind around knowledge. And they were learning about um, how art, in the South we weren't able to express ourselves via art um, for fear of, of retaliation for our thoughts. Also just time, not having the time and the space with the type of lifestyle that blacks had in the South. So when we moved to the North, the scholars were learning about the freedoms that we had to explore art, to explore poetry, to explore literature, and what have you. And then they definitely worked with Natalie on thinking of the colors and what colors they wanted to be represented and the music that came from the city. Um, and that's what's floating up from the top and the essence of uh, trying to capture the life and the verve of the Harlem Renaissance. Thank you, they're beautiful historical uh, paintings and artwork because they tell a story. I love I'm, that. I'm glad you asked. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Anybody else? Do you have any comments? Uh, I just want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, one, of the, one of the themes that I often find myself talking about when I'm up here is around the need for arts education uh, in our schools. We, we tend to talk a lot about STEM, uh, and I kind of beat the drum a lot about, about adding arts uh, to, under, to, to have our scholars understand um, their selves and the human condition. Um, it's actually a skill that is under, uh, it's underappreciated and it's much needed in industry. And it's, uh, I think it's something that, that it's, kind of, it's really difficult to measure, but when our students do it well, uh, you know, I think, you know, those types of things actually change lives. And so uh, I applaud the effort and I'd, lo I'd love to see more. <coughs> Uh, students, please, would you like to? To the young lady that spoke, I want to say thank you for coming out and talking. I know it's a lot, but you did good. It was good. Thank you for sharing. I just wanted to applaud all of you and acknowledge um, the effort you're putting into just making sure that young students are educated about their culture and like the value of art in their culture. So thank you for that. Thank you. Another call? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for asking that question about what each of that uh, painting tells a story of. So, And I remember seeing these at the, the Black History Month, Black Scholars. So I didn't know at that time what the story was, so I'm glad to hear what they were from, north to, uh, from south to north. So thank you for sharing that. Really nice work. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, the new acronym we use is STEAM, not STEM. We try to include the arts into it. Um, and same, uh, I want to say to the young lady you, uh, you spoke uh, from your heart, I just want you, all students actually, to remember that all of us here, we love you too. We love our students. It's hard to come and sit down on these board seats, but if, if we are not passionate enough, we will not do it, you know. So we do care about our students, we love you, we are all open. Anytime you have any problem, come discuss with us. And our superintendent has uh, open door policy. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. We You're appreciate welcome. your work. Thank you. So the, I was wondering, since we are presenting this to the district, if you didn't mind, if we came forward and faced this way, but took a picture with you all uh, in, the, in the background. Is that OK with you? All right. Let's take a break for a few minutes and then take the picture.
we just stand over Can here, we right? go in that? <laughs> stand right here. Yeah. Okay, it's easier to see us. Come closer. Picture ready. Okay. 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 <laughs> Me too, Tracy. Me too. <laughs> step, step, step. Into, there you go. Mark, you can get in there too. Mark, you can get in there too. Why don't you go stand in the back? Here, John. Yeah, fine. Mark, stand back. Yeah, stand back. Um, yeah, stand back there by the girls. Why don't you just keep walking around for a little bit longer? <laughs> <laughs> that should help. <laughs> no, actually, John should take the picture. <laughs> All right, you ready? One, two, three. Perfect. Let me get some of Tracy. I don't think Tracy can get them. Uh, All right, awesome. Ready? One, two, three. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Mr. Smith, good example for those realtors to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need to save all those you know, and bring them one day here. <laughs> okay. Next is. Yeah. Next. Uh, Next agenda item is a public hearing correction, uh, 6.1 public hearing and adoption of uh, resolution number 0091819201 K through 12 sufficiency of textbooks and instructional materials notification of uh, compliance of the education code 60119 Lisa Singh. Hi, good evening, President evening. Chima, members of the board, Dr. Smith. I'm here again uh, for our annual um, public hearing regarding the sufficiency of textbooks and instructional materials. Um, we're also asking you to adopt the resolution that Ms. Chima just referred to. Um, the resolution states that each pupil in the district has sufficient textbooks and instructional materials in specified subjects that are aligned to the academic content standards and consistent with the cycles and content of the curricular frameworks adopted by the State Board. Um, following district policy principles have verified textbook sufficiency and, um, and this is required by law to hold a public hearing to allow for any opportunity for public comment. Okay. Uh, should we open the hearing first? Or? Okay. I would like to open the public hearing for resolution number 009-1819-2018-19, K-12 through sufficiency of textbooks and instructional materials, notification of compliance of education code 60,119. Are there any speakers? No. Okay. There being no speakers, the public hearing is closed. Uh, may I have... May I ask our board members if you have any questions or comments? Okay. Any students? No? Okay. May I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 009-1819-2018-19K-12, sufficiency of textbooks and instructional materials, notification of compliance of education code 60,119. So Second. Roll call, please. Discussion? No. Ro roll call, please. Martinez. Aye. Ramiro? Aye. Nishihira? Aye. Canlis? Aye. Kaur? Aye. Chima? Aye. Next is uh, agenda item number point seven, public <coughs> hearing of visitors on topics not on agenda. Are there any speakers? There are. We have two. First speaker is Josh Vasquez, and after Josh Vasquez will be Shireen Purcell. Is Josh here? Good evening, board. Um, my name is Joshua Vasquez. I'm 18 years old, and I'm James Logan, class of 2018 graduate. And right now, I am currently a political science major at San Jose State University. Uh, I'm here today in regards to questioning uh, 
school safety measures and resources that are being provided for both students and staff in this district. Um, over my four years at Logan, uh, I've experienced multiple cases of student safety being at risk. Uh, whether it be lockdowns, dumb pranks, uh, and even having my football game uh, being stopped due to a nearby shooting. Uh, I see every scenario uh, for, the, for this matter as equal, and um, especially due to the increased amounts of incidents across the country, such like as in Parkland and in Santa Fe. So, um, yeah. Um, in this past school year, uh, a 16 year old student was nearly stabbed to death by four people in a park bathroom right here at Kennedy Park. And including a couple months ago, there's a, a shooting, I believe, by three teenagers that involved police right here on Railroad Ave Avenue. So I have two questions for the board. Um, if you cannot answer them, uh, I just I'd like uh, assurance towards myself uh, if you can discuss these matters thoroughly. But my first question is, what are the measures being taken in order to sustain student safety and prevent different types of lethal weapons of coming onto campuses? And my second question is, would you be willing to look into investing more secure ch checkpoints, campus resource officers, and other resources such as metal detectors and mental health training slash outreach programs, outreach programs for students and staff? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out, and uh, we will definitely take a look into the, these matters. Our next speaker is Shireen Purcell. Hashtag Me Too Teachers. My name is Shireen Purcell, and I'm back again, and will be over and over and over again in an attempt to get transparency and honesty in this district so that it's focused on educating and preparing students for the future. Last board meeting, I spoke about the corruption at the hands of Mr. McNamara and his refusal to release data. Information was presented by ESC staff proudly stating that 52% of the students in language arts and 40% in math are proficient. That is not good. Is the board getting answers why? In asking for the data again, I cc'd it to the board and found my email to you was blocked. I had to send it via another email. Who would block my access to the board and why in asking questions for legitimate data? This time I refused, was refused the information because it was impossible to get and would require 40 to 50 hours of work. The first time, Mr. McNamara falsely said I asked for personal student data. Who is this incompetent and dishonest? This information is not difficult to get and the district has it. Illuminate is a wonderful program where you can put in the fields of data you want and it generates it within minutes. I've seen it done. I've seen somebody not as proficient as the ESC expert pull up a whole eighth grade math and core class and show the correlation between NWEA and SBAC scores and the complete disconnect between grades in core in just a few minutes. This data can answer many questions. The state site has easy access to data. Did you know the district only has 50 to 60% of students proficient in language arts in middle school? But it's up to 75% in high school. Why is it so low in middle school? I think I know considering my students were showing a 70% proficiency while others in my grade were at a 55%. But in over 20 years of my students for performing consistently far better than others, no one was interested in why. Last meeting, Mr. Wang was asking for data on the percentage of students getting into four-year colleges. I think that's a great question. Students get into college based on grades and testing. Were you aware that 40 to 60% of students getting into college need to take remedial classes because they're not prepared? Does this concern you? I know Ms. Metziger is presenting data on college and career readiness later. Only 60% of the students are passing the AP placement exam versus 90% graduating? Doesn't that seem to be a big issue? Testing versus grades? The districts say it's making data-driven decisions, but where is all the data? Why is data so hard for me and the board to get? Does the board know what questions to ask to get it? Or is it just counting on the ESC leadership? 
Why will the ESC not produce the data I asked for? Time. I will gladly share it with the board so you can see what is working and what is not. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shereen, for expressing your views with us, and we are prohibited to have any comments further. Thank yes, you. thank you. There are no further speakers. Yeah, okay. Uh, next is uh, information items uh, from the board. Uh, may I start with the students? Uh, information items no, from your school. No, no. Oh, no, it's the topics not on agenda. Uh, on agenda, right? Is there in speakers? No. no. Information items, yeah. 9.1. Is the public comments, uh, LCAP, local indicators, uh, presentation, Lisa Metzinger. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't have my glasses with me today. <laughs> that makes me look like. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, President Chima, Dr. Smith. <laughs> I'm... Um, as you know, um, with the new LCAP requirements, each year we're required to present the results of our local indicators to the school board. Thank you, Chris. Um, and so tonight we're sharing the results of those local indicators and then we're going to open it up for public comment in case anybody has any feedback before, because after this board meeting, um, we will work together to um, create, some, to finish some self-assessments that we, and then we upload all of our data into the dashboard website. Um, and so this is part of the process. I just want to say that in order for a standard to be met, <coughs> it's a little confusing. It doesn't mean that we met the goal we set for ourselves. For a standard and a local indicator to be met, we have to gather the data, share it with the board publicly before November 16th, and then upload it into the dashboard. That's why a standard is met. So we're saying that it's met because we're going to do that. However, I'm going to share with you that some of our goals were met and some of the goals were not met. But the standard is met just by virtue of me sharing it with you this evening. It seems a little strange, but that's mm -hmm. how it works. So the first priority of our local indicators is um, basic conditions. And that means that um, our teachers are not misassigned, that we are compliant with the instructional materials mandate, which you just heard about, and that we have no Williams facilities complaints received by the district. So we have met this standard. Mm -hmm. Priority two is on implementation of academic standards. Um, again, we have met um, this standard based on our local goal, um, and we gathered this through observations of classroom, um, and we noted that 81.5% of our teachers showed strong evidence of implementing the Common Core standards, uh, which was an increase of 4.5%. Our goal for next year is to get to 100%. Thank you. Um, priority three is around parent engagement. Um, and um, we met this standard, although we didn't meet our goal here. This standard is um, based on survey results. And um, as you can see, we look at the, the degree to which parents feel they are welcome at, the, at their child's school site. And the results were down 1%, um, both in looking at the combination of parents who agree or strongly agree that they feel welcome, and the percent of parents who strongly agree. Uh, we believe, although we're not sure, that um, this might be due to the fact of the Parkland shooting happening at the same time we were surveying our students and teachers. Mm -hmm. And as you know, um, I think that caused all of us, as the previous speaker spoke of, um, to re-examine um, school safety uh, more deeply. Uh, and so we think that might be one of the reasons for the lower results. Um, and the same would be true for priority six under school climate. Um, uh, this past year, 80% of students reported feeling safe at school, which was down 6% from the previous year. Our goal is to increase that by 2% each year. Uh, and then finally, uh, priority seven, this is a new local indicator for this year. Uh, this is about access to a broad course of study. And um, in New Haven, we have open access to all courses at the high school. Uh, and so we're very proud of that fact. Um, that students do have access to a broad, 
broad course of study. And we feel that in looking at our course catalogs, we do offer a wide variety of courses mm -hmm. um, at our middle and high schools. Uh, and, and at the elementary school, our specialist program really exposes students to music uh, and extended science at a very young age. Um, we do believe um, that although we have open access to, to courses K-12, um, we would like to recruit and support more underrepresented populations for enrolling in, taking, and passing the AP exams. And Mr. Bazzani is going to talk a little bit more about this uh, at the next information item. And so with that, um, I'd, I'd like to entertain any questions you might have. Any questions? Yeah, uh, I do. Um, so on that last goal, when you're talking about our last um, priority around open access. Yes. Um, is that common, uh, having all of our uh, higher level and AP classes open to, is that is that relatively common? I would, I don't know how common it is. Orlando, do you know? I mean, I know we were, we started it about six, seven years ago, and it was, it was pretty novel at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Is it still novel? It's not that novel anymore. Mm -hmm. the, 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 with the advent of the standards movement yeah. and the emphasis on equity and student achievement for all students, when you look in when disproportionate numbers of white and Asian kids in AP classes and African American and Latino kids not, okay. more districts have opened access. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it's pretty common um, across the country, actually. So that, that doesn't make New Haven a differentiator is no. what I'm hearing. Okay. We got we we actually have worked with the equity project and and there was an award given to New Haven some years ago for the success of opening up. Right. Yes. And so we might have been on the vanguard but uh, yeah, yeah now it's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. All right. That's all the questions. Any other question? Um yeah what are the current recruitment processes though? Do you have any idea? Uh, I think Abby could explain that a little more, clo uh, more in more detail for you. I would say that um, when they meet with, I mean, they have orientations with students, when they do pre-reg with students, all of those are opportunities to encourage students to enroll in those classes. Uh, in the past, we've offered AP boot camp classes to support students, and I know teachers work with students on the weekend to help students pass their AP tests, but the recruitment is done a lot during uh, pre-reg in the spring, late winter, early spring. Uh, but I think that's something that we can definitely look into improving upon, um, as well as looking into way, creative ways to support students in, because um, I think part of the, the lack of uh, registration in the courses might be knowing that, they, that they're challenging courses and that you might need more support to pass those classes and um, I think anything we can do to help students uh, feel more comfortable taking those classes knowing support is available we we could improve upon most certainly. Oftentimes what happens is you don't have a support system in that class so you choose not to take that class. Right. If, if, if you know there are eight, ten other students who look like you in the class you're likely to take the class. If I'm going to be the only African American or Latino in that class, I'm not going in there. And so it takes a, it takes a very concerted effort for somebody to tap a student on the shoulder and say, you know, you need to, you f you three, you five, need to really go in there together. And oftentimes, I mean, just being totally candid, we put obstacles in the way of that. That that's been the the way of school systems ad forever. And that's why you still see this disproportionality. And again, it's not New Haven. It's across the country. You look at AP courses and, they, and, and honors courses, and there's criteria to keep students out rather than opening the access up to allow them to get in. And so, I mean, it's something that we've worked on in this district way before I came here, and I think it's starting to pay off. And so, so when we... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, no, go ahead. So when we hear concerns... Uh, around the data around um, a, sec uh, a declining um, percentage of students passing the AP test. What I'm hearing is because of open access, the denominator is actually bigger, mm -hmm. and therefore that, that helps explain why yes. the pass rate is 
is not where we want it to be yeah. if you're looking at absolute data. But what you're saying is by, by opening up the classes, you're, you're just going to have a bigger denominator, so it's going to be harder. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And I guess my question is connected to Ms. I, I think um, Scott's going to share some data with you in a moment that might be helpful. Okay. So, um, because we're going to have our actual AP results, as, as you've probably seen in the packet, but mm -hmm. um, we'll, we can look, we can delve into it a little bit more deeply during our next presentation. But let me ask my question because it's related not to the data, but mm -hmm. to Ms. Gore's question uh, and Ms. Uh, Smith's um, response regarding we've been tr we have been trying to um, support underrepresented populations to enroll in these classes mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem to change to the amount that we want so well it's changing that guy, is it it's changing for the data but yeah. it's not where we want it to be yeah because my question is related to what is working and what isn't, and how we could continue to. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll wait. For and I think I think part of the AP boot camp classes we switched it. I don't know if you, uh, you probably don't recall from last year's um, board presentation, but we. Um, we used to offer the classes later in the year for to support AP pass rates now we offer them throughout the year and so we've gotten a little bit better at the timing of, of offering those support classes mm -hmm. um, which we think is helping with the pass rate increasing i should okay. wait and see your report yeah. thank you and just last okay. comment on the recruitment since we still have one member from tvm here um since they work directly with the students uh, at the middle school level, do they mm -hmm. have any sort of, maybe it's a question for both of you, uh, do they have any sort of um, information that they can pass on to their students so that when they are coming into high school that they're actually prepared to take those AP classes? I mean, that's a form of recruitment to some extent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we could provide that to them, uh, definitely. I, I think the other piece is working more at the the orientation of eighth graders going into ninth grade to really work with families to get them thinking about enrolling students in AP courses even if it's not the freshman year later on uh, I think all of those would be great strategies to help increase enrollment mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank you but again I want to reiterate this doesn't start at the high school level mm -hmm. this this weeding out starts very early even mm -hmm. looking at accelerated math and who goes mm -hmm. into accelerated math in those courses so it's not just a high school issue it's a it's a systems wide system issue that we have to control. and I think that's why I said that it really has to start earlier mm -hmm. on and we're talking I mean, we heard a student Sydney I mean she basically said that if it wasn't for TVM or whomever she had the support from she wouldn't be the student she is right, right. I mean if you had these students that you're kind of really grooming them to really do the best they can so these are the students that they can say hey I want you to take AP class and this and that so it's it's not necessarily I mean it, it goes both ways recruitment has to be both ways right you mm -hmm. providing the information doesn't mean it retains with me but we have people on the ground that are doing the work outside of the classroom so I think we could definitely leverage that absolutely thank you, thank you. <clears throat> so are we will we open it up for public comment at this point? Uh, I don't yeah. think. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, um. There aren't, there are no public comments. All right. So we're good. I don't see it here, public no. comments. No, you're yeah. good. Okay, thank you. Um, next agenda item, 9.2, 2017-18 Student Achievement Update Part 2, Lisa Metzinger again. Probably should just stay up here. Hello again. Um, this evening we're going to hear uh, the second part of our student achievement update. Um, and we're going to start with Mr. Pisani, who's going to talk about the college and career readiness pieces, including the graduation rate, AP pass rate. Then we're going to hear from uh, Wee Stevens, who's going to talk about the implementation of our new ELA and ELD curriculum, uh, Wonders and Collections, that's the K through eight, those are the K through eight reading programs. And then we're gonna end with Tracy Noriega talking about uh, our efforts to personalize learning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Director of K-12 Instruction, <coughs> Scott Pisani. 
Good evening, President Chima, members of the board, Superintendent Smith. I'm here tonight to be able to share information with you um, in terms of data related to our college and career readiness um, data <coughs> points. Um, the first slide that we'll share with you is the percentage of graduates by year. This is disaggregated by school site, and so the data that's presented is for the last four school years, and where you can see um, James Logan's high school percentage of graduates per year ranges from 91 to 93 percent, the most current year being at 91. Um, Conley Carabello High School ranging from 49 to 52 percent, the most current year being at 50 percent. And Dakota School for Independent Study ranging from 34 to 48 percent, and the most current year being 34 percent. One of the opportunities for focus that we have that we recognize, particularly at Dakota School for Independent Study, was that there was a decline last year in terms of the percentage of students who graduated. In the single plans for student achievement, which you will see at the next board meeting for your approval, there are activities um, planned within their single plans of student achievement that specifically target the graduation rate. In their planning of activities and setting up goals and metrics for the year, their single plan of student achievement will be an opportunity for them to strategically address this decline. In terms of college and career net readiness and the graduation rate by ethnicity, um, there are two sets of data that are embedded in this single slide. First, what I'd like to be able to point out to you is the co that this majority of this data is related to cohort data, meaning this follows the graduation rate for students who enter ninth grade and exit as 12th grade as a cohort. And so, the last column to the right hand side which says cohort school year 17 18 or for the cohort of students who started together as ninth graders and exited our system last year as senior graduates so what you can see at the top of that is that in terms of all students for the cohort the graduation rate was 83 percent that's the that's the cell that's all the way to the right all the way at the top if you analyze the data underneath that, looking at the cohort data, you're going to see that there are some relative areas of strength in terms of the percentage of students in this cohort whose percentage exceeded overall students. For our students with two or more races, our students who are African American, and our students who are Asian, their percentage in the cohort was greater than all students, that being an area of relative strength for us. An area for focus or of opportunity would be looking at our Hispanic students as well as our white students whose percentage within the cohort will be below the percentage of all students within the cohort. Similarly, the column directly to the left, which it says updated summer 2018, that is the percent of graduates for that one year, not cohort data, but the graduates who left our system in 2018. And again, there are some relative areas of strength where you see for our Hispanic students, the gap has closed and continues to close in terms of the comparison between the percentage who have graduated being 81% to overall all students being 84. And again, opportunities for focus for us is looking at our American Indian and African American students whose percentages were below <coughs> all students in terms of the graduation class of 2018. The next slide, I think, kind of speaks to the comments that were, were, that were made earlier in related to the AP exams. This slide provides data that looks at um, the enroll, number of students enrolled in AP classes, the number of tests that were taken, and the number of tests that were passed with three or above over the course of the last couple of years. What you'll notice for 2017-18 is if you look at the enrollment of students that are in AP class, you will see that there has been a slight decline over the last three years, pretty consistent with the declining enrollment of the district, meaning that there are less students within the district and there is a decline um, in the number of students enrolled in AP classes. Not to marginalize the comments that were made earlier, which we know we have systemic qualities that we have to be able to address in order to encourage students to actually be enrolled into those classes. Additionally, if you look across the bottom, the percentage of students who scored three or above 
for the last four years went from 51% to 53% to 60%, and in the most current year, 17-18, maintained at 60%. Again, those percentages over the last two years being the highest percentages passed for the AP exams. The last slide that I'm going to present to you presents similar information in terms of students who scored three or better on the AP exam, disaggregated by um, ethnic groups. And so you'll see that for relative areas of strength, the percentage of students who scored three or better were students of two or more races, as well as white students. And those that were enrolled that we need to continue to focus upon are African American students, as well as Pacific Islander, being below the percentage. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Hui Stevens, the Director of English Language Services. Is it okay to ask questions about your portion right now, or do we need to wait? I might it's forget okay. my it's question. Okay. It's okay, you can ask questions. Okay, this is just a clarification on the slide uh, where the, the graduation rate by ethnicity. Uh, you mentioned this is a cohort, which means these are students who started together and end together. And that means it doesn't include all the other students. So that means we don't have data for those groups that are not uh, in this cohort. So in the data sets that's here, the column furthest to the right is for the cohort of students over the last four years who graduated in 2018, who mm -hmm. began as a cohort and matriculated through our system and ended as a cohort. The column next to it, which reads at the top, class um, updated summer 2018, that is for all students who were in our system at the end of last year and the percentage of students who graduated regardless as to whether or not they were in the cohort. So if they came in as a sophomore or came in as a junior, stayed with us till they left as a senior, their data would be included within this set. Oh, gotcha. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, you. so, core, so that first column, cohort school year 13-14, uh -huh. that's for student, for a cohort of students mm -hmm. that began four years prior to 1314, mm -hmm. correct? So, so that first column would be 11, 12, 13, and 14, the students that came in in 2011 gotcha. and graduated in 2014. Okay, and, um, and there's no, there's basically no new ads. This basically take one cohort and then follow that same cohort all the way Correct. Through. Okay, and then the updated summer, uh, summer 2018 was all seniors regardless of when they came to, to, to our high school. Yes. That's correct. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Question? Yeah, I don't have uh, necessarily a data question, but just a clarification on how these categories were selected. So on that first um, slide, the graduation rate by ethnicity, we have the Asians, Pacific Islander, and Filipino as three different categories. And if you go down to the last slide uh, of college and career readiness, AP exam scores at three or better, uh, a, uh, Filipinos, Asians, and I think even uh, the Pacific Islanders are combined into one uh -huh. category. So are those like standard categories or are those just internal categories? The categories that are depicted here are the categories that we have used in terms of CalPADS data. And so as students self-declare, there are descriptors mm -hmm. that are utilized in order to organize the data. The, the AP data, is not data that comes from CalPADS, and so that is our internal analysis of our student data. But when we do other analysis of our internal data, we do have them as separate categories. I'm just saying, it's not a big deal, but it always mm -hmm. throws me off, because in some areas, we always have them as three separate categories, and then in mm -hmm. other places, we have mm -hmm. them lump sumped into one. It's one of the challenges that we even noticed yeah. this year, that it, again, even for our Asian students, they're being um, identified in a different way, right. and it makes it so that data is no longer comparable, because it actually is comparing two different groups of students right. by the way that they are organizing the information. Yeah. So that's a challenge for us. And so what we've attempted to do is to create a snapshot mm -hmm. that's consistent to be able to look at comparable data over time to be able to identify our areas of strength and our opportunities for focus and next steps. Thank you. Thank you. So. <clears throat> 
Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, your presentation is over. No? Yes, ma'am. I think no, you were no, bringing please, um, please Ms. Stevens. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board, President Chima, Superintendent Smith. I'm here to present um, the next slide is to update you on the adopt recent adoptions in our English language arts as well as English language development. In last school year, 2017-18, we adopted Houghton Mifflin collections for a middle school curriculum. And this year is where we're spending a lot more time in looking at the alignment between the two middle school and selecting units of study and implementation. So we're moving into our second year at the middle school. This is our first year with the adoption for K-5 um, level, both for Wonders and Maravillas for our two-way dual language immersion program. And this is a comprehensive ELA, ELD pro, um, curriculum program that's offered at a K-5 level. And what we spend a lot of time on in this implementation is developing our teachers with the capacity around the program and the implementation, aligning that to our beliefs of the balanced day framework and our literacy delivery. And both the collections and the wonders curriculum offers integrated and designated ELD support that we're offering for our English learners. It also offers a wide range of digital collections for students to not only utilize at school, but at home and to build that parent to school um, relationship and partnership. And in addition to our professional development, we also provided support and access to our students in our special education programs and building the teacher's um, capacity around the programs and how to differentiate the use of the components to support student learning. With the recent adoption, um, it's created a wonderful opportunity for our site administrators as well as the administrators from Teaching and Learning Division along with Superintendent Smith in doing classroom observations to assess how implementation is going at the sites and addressing student learning needs, as well as building teacher um, wider range of capacity and in delivering a well-rounded instruction in our English language arts curriculum, as well as our English language development curriculum. And we have lookful to tools in our observation tools, and we provide feedback and collaborate around next steps in our implementation and our learning for our students and for our teachers. Um, the last part I do want to mention is that we are continuing with our rigorous curriculum design units of study at the high school level and we also created an opportunity for us to have uh, teachers reconvene and former coaches in December as well as in May to re-examine our K-8 uh, uh, RCD units. So that pretty much concludes our, my part around the curriculum update. Are there any questions for me at this point? Okay. Okay. Um, so you have provided professional development for the teachers in implementing ELD during ELA time? Is that correct? So we provided professional development on a variety of um, topics. One is around the use and the implementation of the program and all its components and how to balance that to create a, um, a framework around literacy. Um, so that's one develop, professional development. The other is to really go back into that to um, examine the ELA and the ELD connection between the two standards and integrated ELD throughout the day. And then um, specifically for middle school, we this second year uh, into the um, adoption and for our K-5, we we're really looking as protected time for our English learners instruction and designated ELD. So there's been a variety of professional development opportunities with different areas of focus and using curriculum to best, best meet the learners in our classrooms. Okay, so I'm trying to understand this for myself. So in the middle school, they have specific protected time for ELD only. They do currently. And in the K to 5, it's integrated with ELA. They K8 K all eight. have protected time for designated ELD instruction. Oh, they do. Yes. Have, is this that is what separate? We're rolling is that in addition to ELA or is it integrated and woven in with ELA and science and 
all the other subjects. Yes. So during so designating, they front load I'm sorry, information. I, I'm trying to picture how it looks like in my head. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so designated ELD is where the ELD standards are the focal point of the standards in that particular lesson delivery, in which we bring in other content areas, whether it's science, next gen for standards. The entire class, ELA even is, though is within not the class. All ELD students. So what we have I done mean, uh, is ELL looked at, students. yeah, so the model in our K-5 classes looks something to the effect of what we call switcheroos, where uh, certain sites with higher EL populations, uh, Cyril's, Emmanuel, Hillview, Crest, they may hold their um, small group instruction, but that small group may be 10, 12 students and create station rotations and personalized learning opportunities for other students during that time within that 20 to 30 minute block. Um, at sites like uh, Easton, Pioneer, and Kitayama, where they provide um, more of a rotation. So all of the, if I have one English learner in my class at a particular level and you have three, we might uh, move students between the two classes to provide instruction that way. Yeah, because I'm trying to picture how the management for the teacher. Uh, if you have, after three groups of kids, it's really difficult to manage the instruction, let alone the planning. Yes. So, so, so they do have teacher buddies, so we could. Yes, there are teacher kids buddies, grade time. level buddies, designated school times at certain sites to allow for that instruction. And right now, <coughs> every teacher has one group. We've managed to support them in a one group of designated ELD. Thank you. Does that clarify? Yes, okay. that's that's okay. very much. It's much clearer than uh, I first heard it. Okay. Uh, because I was trying to put myself in the teacher's shoe, trying to figure out how they're doing it, how they manage the time and the small groups, because sure. each classroom, as we all know, is not going to be on the same level right. of instruction. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. So now I'd like to turn the next few slides around personalized learning to Director of Instruction K-12, Tracy Noriega. Thank you. Good evening again. So I am going to talk to you tonight about personalized learning. Um, as we know, our goal as a district is high quality education for all students through engagement and personalization. So if we use, thank you, if we use this uh, definition by Barbara Bray for a minute to go around us in the definition of personalized learning, it'll help us moving forward. So this slide illustrates the roles the learner and the teacher take um, in personalization. We know that this shift takes time and definitely support. So for example, the teacher changes from an expert lecturer to, lecture to guide and facilitator, and the learner um, analyzes his or her own data and self-assesses in an ongoing cycle. Okay, that's just an example. Now, in terms of support, in 2016-17, we had a teacher on special assignment that delivered professional development <coughs> and coaching with various teachers. She provided coaching in the core four, um, project-based learning, and um, blended learning, for example, station rotations. In fact, the websites um, that she created on personalized learning and project-based learning are still actually up on our district website as resources. In 1718, uh, we received professional development support via education elements. That specific teacher on special assignment went to one of our elementary schools in a, as an assistant principal, and we did not um, fill that position. So in 1718, um, the support came from education elements, and education elements worked with a few teachers from Alvarado Elementary, um, Easton Elementary, and Pioneer Elementary. We also received um, some support from West Ed for Universal Design for Learning uh, with the staff at Kitayama. This year in 2018-19, um, Education Elements is finishing up the last of the support with Easton um, teachers and Pioneer. Um, they were very gracious in terms of kind of helping to continue to support um, even though our contract was only for the 17-18 school year. So there are no extra funds going towards that for this particular school year. 
We just actually had a learning walk with education elements at Easton yesterday with the consultant and the administration at, um, at Easton Ele Elementary. We visited all of the teachers that received the support last year. The consultant wrote today in her follow-up email, it was great to see how teachers have sustained so many of the strategies and models that they began to implement last year despite learning a new curriculum. So Easton definitely has some next steps for moving forward. Now, in 2016, in June 2016, actually, we started the last three summers. We hosted a personalized learning summit, a mini conference, if you will, here in New Haven Unified. They were all coordinated by our teachers on special assignment at the time. Teachers were paid to plan and provide workshops as well as attend. Um, classified administrators attended as well. And each year we partnered with East Bay Q, formerly the Q, formerly um, Computer Using Educators, um, an organization which many of our staff belong to. So you can see through the years, um, we went from a two-day to a three-day to a one-day conference. Um, the sessions definitely increased in terms of ratio and the number of days, and we had numerous folks in attendance. Um, and the topics there ranged from Google Classroom to visual thinking strategies um, to equity-based instruction to using online tools, all towards um, the goal of personalized learning strategies. So that concludes my slides. Do any of you have any questions for me? Any questions? Board members? I actually have a question. Um, 2016-2017, uh, slide number nine, you said there's a PD or professional development happen and then underneath that there's project-based learning. Um, and I think I brought this up last time too. I know that IBC is in their second year of uh, project-based learning and CCMS has not had any project-based learning. So do those teachers participate in these PDs? Do they, I mean, if we find value in project-based learning, has there been a push to implement that as CCMS right. as well? Um, I was remiss in missing that last bullet at the very bottom for 2018-19. So uh, for a number of years, we've been partnering with Envision uh, Learning Partners. Um, it started with the assessment leaders um, that were under um, my supervision a while back where we were looking at alternate assessments and the, and the concepts of deeper learning. Um, the grant continues um, because we are actually the first um, in, as part of the Bay Area Performance Assessment, Assessment Network. So through that grant opportunity, we'll be, we'll be supporting um, teachers, the eighth grade teachers at IBCMS with their portfolio defense. This coming year, year will be their third um, implementation of that. And um, a few teachers at Cesar Chavez uh, Middle School will be embarking on their work in, in the aspect of student reflection. Now, this, was, this is all through the grant um, that we received through my work with Envision Learning Partners. Um, in terms of support for project-based learning, remember that in 1718, because that specific teacher and special assignment went ahead and uh, went to become an administrator, we didn't fill that position, right, in order to, to save. Um, and in terms of providing professional development, I know Kim Clint, who is also um, kind of a trainer, a support, um, she helped with a few teachers, but in terms of kind of rallying the troops to have this specific PD, that, that's been tough. So kind of thinking about moving forward, you know, going back to the shift, it it, it, support is absolutely necessary. So trying to figure out ways where we don't, we don't have to take people out of the classroom, bring a consultant in. I think we have a lot of folks within the system that can, you know, can support other teachers, but that also means that we have to provide a structure for release, substitute teachers, um, a time away from the classrooms, um, hourly for teachers if it doesn't if it doesn't work within the day, all of those things. So I just want to leave that because we don't necessarily have answers to that. All of these uh, support systems for moving forward are financial implications. We actually did have a cadre of teachers at CCMS last year. If you remember, there was a small number of teachers who were interested in moving to project-based learning, and that got derailed with negotiations. So we have not come back to that this year to revisit that. But there was a group of, I think it was eight or nine teachers who had committed to get it started, and then with work to rule and everything else, it just got derailed. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why Education Elements uh -huh. is finishing up their support this year, 
a lot of this support was supposed to have done be, been done last year, but because of contract negotiations, there was um, a bit of a stall. Again, they were just gracious enough to continue to work with us this year. Question. Okay, thank you. So I'm le uh, that leads me to believe that um, at least in the middle school, it's not systemic. So what the kids get at IVC does not look the same at CCMS. Um, which leads to the question of equity. And the other question is, um, how does that look like in the K K-5 and the high school? So in terms of project-based learning, I would say implementation of project-based learning strategies is spotty. There, IVC, I would say, is probably the school with, with um, some, some consistency, at least across a grade level, um, and then a few teachers here and there. Um, but in terms of, there are a few teachers at Chavez that do implement project-based learning strategies. Um, are, are there enough to collaborate, maybe two at a grade level, perhaps? Um, I know that if within um, pockets at Logan, especially within the Ethnic Studies Department, there are project-based learning strategies in play um, in, within ICL. Again, a few teachers around the district um, at the various elementary school sites. Um, I think if you put them all together in one room, we'd probably fill the room, but in mass at one school site, IVCMS would be the concentration. I think the farthest, the, the K-5 school, that's the furthest along is gonna be Pioneer. They actually embraced it and they lost a teacher who was <coughs> instrumental in, in leading that work, but Pioneer is probably the furthest. They've had parent nights, project-based learning nights. I don't know if don't honestly know if they're doing it this year, but they have done it the last four or five years. I, I think what we've been struggling with in teaching and learning, especially this year, is that, remember, we cut $3 million this year, the majority of which came from teaching and learning. And so we lost all of our instructional coaches. We lost our coach who had expertise in project-based learning and personalized learning. We're hoping that we have systemic capacity, but it's been challenging. I would be lying to say otherwise. Most of our resources this year have gone towards implementation of the new ELA, ELD curriculum because that's brand new for teachers and we want to support them through that process. So the limited funds that we have for, for professional development went there. We would love to be able to increase project-based learning and have it systemic throughout the system, but right now we're making very difficult choices, and so um, we we uh, we has been very creative um, this year in providing curriculum leader stipends um, to help with the wonders implementation because you can imagine trying to implement a new curriculum. K-8 really uh -huh. with no instructional coaches that's that's challenging and so we're doing the best we can with the limited resources we have and we do have the expertise in project-based learning here in the system um, it's just a matter of tapping into those individuals and really finding the resources to be able to either release teachers or pay them hourly for professional development but it is it is something we struggle with and mm -hmm. we value and we know it's it's it is an equity issue we we right. understand that i'm just yes. trying to understand where we are um, yes. as a district and when it comes to that so if you remove project base from the personalization personalized learning i'm sure mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of other things to Absolutely. personalized learning and um, project based is just one of those components. Right, and the core four that Tracy spoke of um, includes station rotation, right. which really helps with implementing the designated ELD, which we have allocated funds to help support teachers through that. So students might be in one station where they're doing online learning, adaptive learning that is at their instructional level, so they can work independently uh, at a computer, for example. Another group might be working with the teacher another group might be collaborating with peers and that's where you could actually have some project-based learning going on in those types of situations and so um, that type of learning is continuing and we and as needed um, we do have the resources so that if a site is interested in further exploring project-based learning we could put
put them in touch with the teacher or the teachers at their site and they could start it at the site level. But when we lost that teacher on special assignment, it really limited our ability to provide the kind of professional development needed to have it systemic. Does that make sense? Yes. So there are so many challenges from all sides and all ends. Uh, now I'm looking at the teacher's perspective. Um, in integrating ELD during ELL mm -hmm. for the ELO, ELA during ELA mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> personalization happening also. Yes. I, I'm just hearing this, if I were the teacher, I'd probably feel like, oh God, this is overwhelming. Yes. And no uh, coaches. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question it relates to how do we balance all these, there's no coach, there's no money right. to coach, there's no money to provide P, PD for the teachers, but we also want this wonderful program for our kids. Uh, I, I, I guess my question is how do we, how do, how, what are we doing to provide balance so that people are not overwhelmed at the same time, students are getting something that needs to be happening? I think our principals are doing an outstanding job, I think with the support of, of Ms. Stevens, to um, gather information around the implementation of the new ELA, ELD curriculum. Um, they talk about their strengths and weaknesses. We have a Google Doc that we look at. When we visit with principals during those visits, we ask them to share what's working, what isn't, what supports they need. And so we do have money reserved for professional development. And Ms. Stevens and I were just talking about that today. So as we implement, we kind of um, assess where teachers are, what supports they need. We have allocated funds to have teacher leaders at each site to help with the implementation of Wonders. And so that's what we're doing. We're kind of looking at where teachers need support and we're trying to provide them with the, the funds that we do have um, and, and also build on the leadership capacity of teachers we have at the sites. Thank you for mm -hmm. your work. This is challenging uh, work right here and we have challenging times coming ahead of us. Any more questions? Thank you so Thank much you. for uh, making us understand that <laughs> how are we handling all those different um, strengths. <clears throat> Next agenda item is 9.3, items from the board and superintendent. Let's start with our students. Uh, information from the board members. You have any activities going on what's happening in your schools or any updates? Uh, we can start with the other board members if you want to wait, if you want to take. Can you start? Um, so just to report back from Logan students, we just had our homecoming last, or two weeks ago, so the rally went successfully, so did the game, as did the dance. Um, the athletic department also hosted its Hall of Fame banquet this weekend, which was, we had a lot of alumni and a lot of athletes come in. Um, our next community event that we're planning to put on as a leadership class is our movie night on the turf, which would be open to the public on October 26th. And most... Uh, or all sophomores are preparing to take the PSAT later this month um, as paid for by the school. And our annual blood drive is October 25th and we have around 120 spots for students and staff to sign up. Wow, good. Are you ready? Yeah. I don't have upcoming events, but I have past events that sure. came in place. We had the blood drive as well that just came by recently. Mm -hmm. And then also I got to join this, uh, but it was job shadowing for um, for being a probation officer and mm -hmm. so I got to go on that trip and it was uh, really informational and that's actually something that I'd like to go towards and they're doing a lot of more job shadowings um, they're trying to get more kids to give in more um, options of like ideas of what they'd like to do or seeing where these kids would want to go with their further and further in their career and so I think job shadowing is a lot like really good that we implemented into our school year um, our volleyball team's doing really good uh, I think that's about it for right now. Thank you. And who is coordinating their job shadowing? The job shadowing is done by Ms. Gonzalez. She is our econ teacher. Oh, okay. But she's also taking the role of being the um, chaperone and person that we're actually going with the ride and everything like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Buzz? Yeah, um, so I'm going to let uh, Member Callis go, okay. go through all the foundation stuff. Uh, but uh, I did actually have a qu couple questions with regard to governance. And one of the things that I, I think I brought up in the past, I just want to see if we can have a quick conversation on the board about this, is uh, board communications. Mm -hmm. uh, right now they're coming across as PDF attachments. And I'm just wondering, is there a way that we can actually get the individual board communications just as regular emails, as opposed to ha having to have a, a PDF, separate PDF attachment? Like, is there like a reason why we do that? Or just that's the way we have always done it? Just for tracking. Just for tracking. So yeah. we could actually put the BC number in the subject line and have it be the same thing, right? It just makes it easier for me to read it on the phone, honestly, <laughs> because then I have to open up the PDF and then zoom in on my phone. So just if, if, if if that would be something that the board would consider, or I just want to kind of bring that up. It doesn't matter to me. If it it's will be a PDF do. versus Word doc. Well, no, I guess my point is like the, the board communication, the body of the board communication, mm -hmm. that is actually on a PDF that you have to open up an attachment and read on the phone. There is a way to, to insert the object a PDF into the body of the, if you. I'm just saying take yeah. the content that's in the, in the body of the PDF and actually just put it in an email. Yeah. And then just whatever's attached to it, just do an attachment. It just make it easier for me to read it on the train. Oh. Okay. Just okay. because of just, you, Lon. Oh, I, I, I'm sure it would be better for other people as well. That's just one thing. Um, and then the other thing that I think we started talking about in previous meetings, maybe, um, and that was around um, potentially getting access to the documents as they become available, instead of actually waiting for them to be to, to be put into board docs. Oh, you mean um, the board agenda? You wrote the item packet, so that okay. like so that way, like or yeah, the the, the actual individual documents they don't have to be packaged up, just so that we can actually have access to them in a drive. Is that something that we can't do? That's a governance thing. Well, well I guess the next question could be: Could we have them before Friday? Yeah. I've been We've been getting them the last couple of times. We put them out on Wednesdays. Okay. It, was it Wednesday? Okay. Yeah. Well, we okay. did. All right. So. Um, oh, okay. So so, so we don't. So we're thing. we're not waiting. Then I guess is what I'm hearing. It's so maybe if you guys can tell us that they're already uploaded. So I think you've been doing that. Yeah. I I've checked. When I give, when I make the meeting active for everybody for mm -hmm. you to see, when I make it active for the board members to. Mm -hmm. um, you get an email okay. from the board, and I ducks, did yeah. that last um, Wednesday about ten o'clock. Okay. Which you should get an email that says it's ready for you to view and click it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're trying to be more efficient and get it to you by Wednesday. Got it. Mm -hmm. As far as getting all the little attachments to you, be like, here's one, and it, it just gets messy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't have that in one package. Quite okay. Honestly. That's fine. I just wanted to bring it up yeah. just as a point for discussion. Um, that's all I had. I'll let Linda handle all the events because she's got all the same events. Alrighty. Okay, Linda. <laughs> well, just this good news. I did attend the October 6th Science at the Park and um, my egg broke. <laughs> However, we still got $1,500 uh, to go to dollars to go to foundation. So um, it could have been 2000 but my egg broke. I did a good job. It just the egg would not good cooperate. Job, Linda. <laughs> All right. So on um, October 13, that was Saturday. There was a uh, grassroots meeting uh, sponsored by CSBA. I just want everybody to know that we have a local Pacer guy now. Pacer stands for. Let me see if I could get this. Public Affairs and Community Engagement Representative. He's a local person. In in the past, we only have Dennis Myers who is coming all the way from Sacramento. Now we have Gabe Weiss, who is our local representative. And on Saturday, we had a uh, combined meeting with Contra Costa and Alameda County School Boards. Um, but the bottom line is we were working on um, trying to get full and fair funding for our schools from Sacramento and trying to preempt the next governor and making sure that he understands that we want a piece of that pie before he puts his dream uh, project for our schools and other people in the in the state looking at that money. So, so I'm trying to encourage us when we have these meetings, and there will be more. It's a three-hour session, yeah. so mm -hmm. it's pretty long and pretty substantial mm -hmm. to come and join us. I also sent all of you and tagged you on the petition for um, uh, funding. 
from the state. I hope you all completed that because it's happening right now. It's mm -hmm. very important that, that we become part of this um, coalition and we are trying to hopefully include and invite superintendent's council, the CTA, the classifieds, all of us so that um, the state could hear what we need for our schools and not get whatever they designate for us little crumbs and then we divide it among ourselves and fight up over that little crumb so uh, this is a good time <coughs> for it some people think we should wait but i think it's a it's the time to let the future governor know that we need to fund our schools appropriately for the things that are happening right now before they start putting other new things in addition to the things that we can't fully fund right now so please come and join and um and uh, join at uh, this legislative um, action. And then we also have surveys, I think you probably have in your email, to see how you could take part in this whole thing and see what you think we need to uh, be doing in order to make this happen. There's also a mentorship program coming up um, where uh, uh, experienced board members are um, asked to mentor new board members, with, especially with the election coming up right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we would like to make sure that we are all singing the same song and help new board members, not necessarily the one at your district because of Brown Act, but no. other board members in other districts. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they ask for um, fundraising to make that happen because it doesn't come free. It, it takes a lot of advocacy and work from people to make that happen. But I think that the topic being obtaining full and fair funding is uh, it's about time. We need to make sure we work and making that happen. Um, October 27, there is a uh, Filipino historical, not historical, history celebration uh, celebration at um, 4 to 9. That would be a Saturday. So you're all invited to come and support. And then on October 20th, uh, we have the Foundation Gala. Uh, please come and join us. Uh, all the funds that we earn from this gala goes back to the students and to the teachers and programs, especially now that we have uh, limited funding. I also want to announce that um, all the uh, teachers of the year from each school and the class of the year from each schools are uh, being comped. So we want to invite them. Please come. Uh, it's free for you. Just let um, Miss um, Valdez or Mr. Uh, Smith or myself know if you are coming hopefully as soon as possible. I know it's last minute, mm -hmm. but... Hmm? Do they know about Do over teachers of the year, they know about it? We just learned today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we put the word out today. Well, we just got the money too, so... Oh, uh, <laughs> so we put the word out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just... Uh, I think it's wonderful to be able to invite mm -hmm. them not having to um, pay for them. Uh, that will be it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Carl. Yeah, I don't have too much to share. I just want to congratulate the two teachers who won the Alameda County Teacher of the Year Award. We had um, Legretta Banks from uh, Tom Kiriam Elementary School, and we also had one of the Mission Valley ROP teachers at Logan, uh, Dana Upula. Uh, so congratulations to both of them. And they were, um, I couldn't stay for the whole ceremony, but I believe that the the next round is going to be the state level teacher of the year yeah. so yeah. it'd be pretty impressive hopefully we'll remote remote got one yeah i stayed for oh you stayed for the whole thing okay yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a beautiful ceremony yes. but long <laughs> yeah. but it was it was nice yeah that's it that is all i have okay uh first thank you so much linda for attending that csba event it was on my calendar but there were so many other things so i just I knew that you were going, so I just let it go <laughs> for you. And it's a good thing that um, we always say that in California, we are the 41st in the nation in terms of the power pupil funding. So uh, CSBA is gearing already uh, towards the advocacy work, the future legislature and the new governor, so that be our schools, they can have better funding. Um, which is good, I, and I, I support that. I will participate as much as I can. Um, you can start with the survey and the petition. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's no problem. Okay, for me, um, it was kind of my new resolution for the new year. Uh, I was active. <laughs> new year means in terms of the new school year. 
um, that I would like to get uh, involved more on the ground level and uh, I was able to successfully participate in some of the events after the last board meeting. October 4th, uh, I was, uh, oh, I participated in the Alameda County Teacher of the Year uh, in Castro Valley. And thank you so much, Dr. Smith. And I think some other staff members, they uh, participated there as well. Had quite a turnout. I forgot to take a picture, <coughs> one picture with you. <laughs> I was able to take one picture with our uh, I'm a witness teacher of the year. So teacher of the year, right, right. Right, the Right, the but uh, <laughs> I did not take one with you. Um, it was very inspirational event actually and um, to see the showcase of the work of the other teachers in other school districts. Um, so it was a good inspirational whole event. October 1st, I, uh, October 5th actually, I participated in the walk and roll to the schools in Saros Elementary School and this, this was another refreshing uh, event to get in touch with the little ones, you know, when they come and ask them, did you come, did you walk, did you come on the scooter or your bike or car? And there was a survey taken, um, very well organized from the Sales Elementary <coughs> Vice Principal and some of the staff members there. Then uh, October 6th, it was kind of continuous, I participated in the New, New Haven Foundation's Martin Strat event and supported them, sponsored that event. It was another good walk and good conversation with the community members. Next was uh, October 11th. <laughs> was a busy day for me. State of the city luncheon with the state senator. And um, no, not state senator, the actually for the, for the, the state of the city the with the yeah. mayor. Right, right, right. <laughs> and then after that, I went also went to the uh, Latino Heritage uh, Month celebration in Castro Valley with State Senator uh, Bob Kiaski's mm -hmm. event. And uh, then in the same night, we had the League of Women Voters Forum here in this room uh, for the candidates running for the uh, school board this year. And uh, me and another candidate, uh, we participated and there were some well-meaning questions, uh, good discussion and informational. Um, October 12th, I joined the Pioneer Elementary PTC for the coffee, morning coffee. And I was surprised to see there were so many parents, they participated they and they were up. so engaged in the networking and <laughs> talking to each other. And so I took that opportunity to talk to some of the parents, uh, um, especially who has Indian heritage because uh, from my own experience, I have seen that many people, they don't send their school, their, their kids to our schools, they send them to the private schools. So I started the conversation to ask them, to ask their fellow friends and families to, uh, to kind of market and, uh, and let them know the how good our schools are. And they promised me and they were surprised to know that about the good programs we have in our schools. So it was very uh, time, time well spent. And then, uh, oh yeah, last Saturday, I was fortunate, to in, uh, to part fortunate enough to participate in the Logan's Hall of Fame athletics uh, program, was well attended, and I was able to meet with some of our former administration uh, people, the principal um, Laughlin, uh, who was a principal, right, right, <laughs> for 39 something years, I think, so, mm -hmm. and his wife, and uh, uh, Kay Emanuel, who was our previous student's wife as well. So um, well attended, well done event. Um, through all those activities, it gives me opportunity to uh, talk to some of our parents and students and uh, uh, community sees that board members, they are involved um, in the students' uh, learning and those processes. It was my very refreshing. Um, and I look forward to participating in the gala e event this Thursday. Do you need more tickets? I think we have our zone, and I know that there are some uh, extra tickets. If somebody else wants it, then I, I'm definitely asking some people in the community. Right. Yeah. So, do you have any question? Um, Ms. Cameras, sorry. Um, I was just wondering when the Filipino uh, history event is going on, or where also? At IBC, uh, October 27. For tonight, and there are various events, including uh, basketball, food, of course, uh, arts, 
Okay. Thank you. You're if you if you can send us the some kind of flyer information, yeah, yeah that's right. I think I tagged you on Facebook. It's right. <laughs> Tracy Noriega has put it out too. I'll I'll ask Tracy. Yeah, please send it to us. Yeah. There's so much happening on the yeah. Facebook it's, sometimes. It's, it's <laughs> also on the yeah. It's New in Haven New Haven News. news. Um, Again. Yeah, yeah. I've seen it three times now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you. That's my report. All right, Smith. just a couple of quick things, but I, it, it, there's a theme running through this. For all of the thousands of people who are watching out in the community. <laughs> they're, they're watching it just The us. traffic at our schools yeah. is becoming unsafe for our kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people who are driving in this community should stop and breathe and pause and, re and realize that they are jeopardizing kids' safety. Mm -hmm. We have people who are making left-hand turns and no, and where it says no left-hand turns. We have parents who are acting, forgive me, who are acting uncivil mm -hmm. when they're called on it. We have, a, we've had situations where people are, we've actually had confrontations with mm -hmm. parents who have been questioned and I'm asking people to self-monitor. The theme here has to be respect and civility but safety for our kids first and foremost it's so it, 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 it only takes five or ten seconds to slow down and you don't jeopardize anybody it's not that big of a hurry but we see parents who are being bad role models for kids mm -hmm. kids are watching and I remember this happened like 10 or 12 years ago in San Diego where the district had to go through an entire professional development for parents on how to be civil and respectful. We don't need to do that if people would just stop, slow down, and, and, and not jeopardize kids. So that's my first thing. <clears throat> and I, and I, I really, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's dis distressful mm -hmm. the way people are behaving. Mm -hmm. I think, and again, I say that all the time, we're better than that. I also want to call attention to 11.7 .7 on the agenda in support of the Bay Area United Against Hate Week mm -hmm. that is coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing. We just need to take care of each other. We need to be kind to each other. We need to care about each other. And when we see things that we don't want to tolerate, we need to talk to people about that behavior. Mm -hmm. Is this the way we want to live is this the society we want to live in and I truly think that not just in New Haven I think humanity is better but sometimes we just lose our heads and we get in a hurry and we we forget that that's a human being who we're talking to or who is sitting across from us and then we stop in the shock after somebody's hurt and say oh I didn't mean to do that well if you didn't mean to do it <laughs> don't do it and so this resolution speaks to my heart and I hope that everyone will pause and read it. We, they're, they're, we're gonna put some signs out that say um, everyone belongs here and we hope that people will internalize that. So that's my theme. We have a new director of facilities I'm going to ask Annette Hellman to introduce him. Poor guy, he got his indoctrination introdu tonight. <laughs> He's probably sitting here wondering, whoa, what did I get it. myself, I myself into? <laughs> but as you know, Nick Arps left, yes. and we were fortunate to get this gentleman, and Annette will introduce him. Sure. Uh, good evening, members of the board and Superintendent Smith. Um, as mentioned, uh, Mr. Arps left uh, to another school district far, far away. Um, with about 70% left in our bond program um, and some major projects that are in the pipeline. I am very happy to introduce to you uh, our replacement for our Director of Facilities, Mr. David Estrada. I will, he's right here. <laughs> thank you, I wanna especially thank uh, Dr. Smith and uh, personnel for getting me onboarded. I'm looking very much forward to uh, bringing up to speed the projects you have to come forward. I probably worked about a little over 30 years working in construction projects, so I'm really ready to go and to look forward to dealing with the traffic 
uh, issues that you have along with the other construction projects, but I, I'm going to work with all and, and thank you all for the welcome that your school has provided. Uh, believe me, everywhere I've gone, I've got much uh, thank yous and hellos, and it's very much appreciated. And for that, again, thank you. Uh, any questions? For a newcomer? Uh, just welcome. Yeah, uh, welcome we didn't aboard. scare you away. <laughs> no, no. Welcome, welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Welcome aboard, and I would like to know a little bit about you. I didn't get a chance to read your application or anything. It was your background. Where did you work for the construction? Uh, so I've worked for construction for uh, Lodi Unified, for San Lorenzo. I spent 10 years as the CM and also as a director at uh, San Lorenzo Unified. I worked in Sacramento as well. I see. Uh, I worked in also as a contractor. Uh, as well. I've got a little over 30, 35 years working. So you have a contractor's license? I have a contractor's license. I'm also, know, believe it or not, cited as a d division of state architect, a licensed uh, okay. inspector as well. Did I consulting see. as an inspector and as a construction manager. Oh, I really uh, appreciate that. I don't know. I don't know if you know that. I'm a civil engineer myself. Oh, very good. Yeah, so that's why I'm interested in all that work. Thank you. No, thank you. And we you. need to have somebody who has that kind of experience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate thank you. that. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. So, I don't remember. Oh, um, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for, uh, it was on my mind since we got that email from the, one of our school uh, employee actually, right? Yeah. So, uh, I am no, thinking good. that if we, we are good, but I think like you mentioned that we need to um, kind of make our parents aware of the problem. Uh, is it possible maybe we, if we can um, have a like phone dial message to all of them? Is it, is it okay to do that? What, yes. what are your thoughts about it? Uh, kind of reminder. We're asking the principals to hand it side by side. Right, right, yeah, okay, <coughs> okay, that's good, thank you. I mean, I think, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's, it's actually been a thing for a while. Um, it just, it cut, that thing kind of comes mm -hmm. and goes and spurs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we brought it up in the past. Um, I just would like to maybe just put a pin in it that, you know, this is something that would make sense to kind of try to peel it apart to see if we can get to some root causes. Uh, I know it's kind of hard. We talked about this in the past. Uh, but I've heard of, I've heard of parents, um, specifically my mother-in-law who dropped off my nieces at my ear. There'd be parents that would just actually leave their car in yep. the yep. middle of the mm -hmm. street yep. yeah. and would leave yeah. with the car. Yeah. And so it's things like that where mm -hmm. like, let's just understand kind of why that is. And sometimes there's no reason I get it, but mm -hmm. maybe maybe that's an opportunity for us to understand the problem a little bit more and see if the board and the city can work together mm -hmm. to kind of detail some, some, some. You know, there, there's things that you, you'll get like enforcement actions on it, you'll get like maybe a week or two where people are behaving Exactly. the city but it's I want to say it's it's been rather it's been reactive yeah uh, you know the problem comes up and then we deal with it yeah. rather than having a proactive, proactive, proactive campaign around traffic safety systemic. yeah and fixes yeah I get it signage and cross what is it the blinking uh, crosswalks and mm -hmm. So we, we did have a conversation today about blinking crosswalks and better signage and but some of it is just rude human behavior. Yeah. <laughs> and some of it is not enough people power to be mm -hmm. where we need people stationed mm -hmm. with, you know, crossing guards or parents. I mean, if it says no, no parking in the red, don't yeah. park in the red. I mean, we don't have anybody there to give them tickets. The interesting thing is, is like on these internet, uh, the, the national, you know, walk or roll to, 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 um, to school day, yeah. you'll get like a bunch of people riding their bikes or walking. And mm -hmm. the question is, why do we only do that one day a week? <laughs> or one day, one day, one a day, year. I'd settle for one day a week. But like, you know, <laughs> why do we do it like once a year? So uh, the question is like, how, 
how can we celebrate that one day in a year, but we can't do it the other exactly. day of the year? Exactly. You have a plaque. You show them, um, Mr. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, uh, I ride my bike yeah, here. That's why. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah, so anyway, I, I think that there are some opportunities there to understand that a little bit more. So, I don't know. We got a lot of things <laughs> to deal with, but that would be one thing that mm. we should this one kind of look at. This yeah. one's big. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And David already mentioned that he will take care of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to put that Thank on your you. list. Facilities. Yeah. I see. Okay, next is agenda item number 10. Uh, actually, oh, um, sorry, before I move forward, you just mentioned the. Um, oh, any board members wants? Let's, let's, let me go by the, <laughs> by the book. Okay. Um, is it the will of the, the next action item right uh, so I was thinking the consent agenda but it's not there yet so no, it's, it's like it's action item 10.1 proposed expenditure freeze for fiscal year 2018-19 um, and right here <laughs> good evening once again so earlier in the evening we were having a very good discussions regarding our goals for our students um, equity, personalized learning, I get to follow on that with regards to discussion in terms of expenditure cuts and freeze on essentials. It's never a good thing to be in this position. <laughs> but, um, so item 10.1, um, I'd like to frame it before I go to what that item is for. In June, you adopted a budget along with a board resolution affirming a budget gap of about 4.4 million. In August, due to the state final budget, that number changed. It became a larger number to about 6 million. In September, we presented to you the unaudited actuals. We were able to capture some savings after closing the books, lowering that shortfall to about 5 million. That is the current situation that we are in based on the information that we know at this point. So item 10.1, the last time that the district had to implement a, an expenditure freeze, I believe was in 2012. So that was about six years ago. We were in the thick of the state economic crisis. We had a recession. This, is, this item is before you. There is no recession. There is no state economic crisis at this point. That's not what we're hearing. But the one thing, and I've said this, I've stood, I've stood before you when I um, presented the 45-day budget revision. The one thing that, well, let me put it this way, we have very little control of the revenues that we receive. We have the most control in the expenditures that we implement. What happens at the state level is often different than what it looks like at the local level. We are at the local level. The state doesn't make decisions on our behalf with regards to expenditures. And therefore, these are the things that we put in place in order to be able to control and maintain these things. Therefore, this item is a freeze on um, ex expenditure freeze as described to you tonight. Um, a freeze of expenditure is usually a very effective way, especially if it's implemented thoughtfully, but more than anything, if it's implemented with fidelity so that we will be able to position ourselves in the years to come with the full implementation of the local control funding formula and yet cost, on the other hand, are rising. This is one way that we could, um, like I said, position ourselves in terms of the outlook for our district fiscal condition. Um, with that, I can answer any questions that anyone might have. Any questions from the right. students? Students, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Lance? Yeah, so one question is, um, so I've got a, a couple. Um, looking at the attachment, I guess the question is on action tonight. What, my understanding is that we've, we've already enacted a resolution. Um, the question is today, what is the action? Is the action, because the only thing I saw attached was the, was the expenditure form. The form, Is yes. it, Is that what we're, so how, how it would work is after your approval of this item, uh, we've listed potential items that we could, um, that we are considering to uh, not add to the line items that we already have in the revised budget that we have. So how, how this would look like is, uh, first of all, we, we do not add 
to the spending plan that we already adopted or that we already approved. Okay. And through the course of the year, uh, if we can ratchet down some of those, even though they already are budgeted for, would of course be better for us in terms of saving. Curta what this does is we will, able to, we will be able, or hopefully we would be able to curtail our spending in the current year so that that five million outlook for 1920 wouldn't be at the level depending so, so on what we can capture from this item. So this is only on incremental things that aren't already accounted for in the budget? Yes. Okay. That's the, that's the first tier. I look at it as this is the first tier. Now, even if it's already in the budget, if it's something that we could save or defer to the following year or do something different creatively so that we don't spend it, then that's a better situation for us. But okay. the first thing is to not add any more to the, the current spending plan. So speaking only on behalf of like the board because like the uh, CSB uh, CSBA conference and masters in governance training all that was currently in the existing spending plan yes yes that stuff, so that's already that's part not of on the freeze right <clears throat> okay um, and then okay so the board okay I think you answered that question if the board has more questions, let me know, and I'm going to go through this and see if there's any questions that aren't covered. I just yet. have one question. Oh, you can Linda, did you have okay. any questions? Well, I'm going to wait until he's done and see what Lizzie has. He said uh, you guys can go, and then he will have more questions. I'll come back until. Okay, yeah. Ms. Cole. Um, yeah, my only question was, um, so there's an attachment for a waiver. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the form. A f <coughs> yes, the form. So if, what would be the criteria for that form to be accepted? And if and when it is accepted, will the board come to know again what those items were that were approved? Well, one of the things that we are formulating right now, um, simultaneously with this, are those criteria. We, of course, have to attend to things that are um, risking our safety, um, staff and student safety if it's something that's mandated by any levels of the um, government then we would have to comply to that so we, we are putting those different tiers of criteria in order to be able to you know have a game plan on how to move forward the form is the mechanism for us to be able to vet those things that are not currently yet existing in the budget Okay, so this is actually germane to some of the conversation that we had about kind of budget approval and things like that. Is there a way for us, when the agenda item comes to us, for it to be flagged as wave, uh, being waived from the expenditure freeze? Just yeah, so we can kind of like, know. okay. If we would know when those uh, waive, waivers were accepted yeah. and why. Either that or add the, either or add the approval form to the item so that we could see that. Mm -hmm. And we're in the budget, the line item, wherever, you know, the change okay. happens. Yeah. Okay. Along the same question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lance, did you have any more questions? One more thing is, do we have any objective indicators that will allow us to understand when we can lift the freeze? Like, when we, when we will, when will we, what number will we look at when we say, okay, we're out of the woods, we, we can lift the freeze, and is there an objective trigger there that we can actually lift that? Well, given that our based on information that we have right now, given that our budget shortfall is about five million, I don't think we are near so that the, trigger at this point. So when the f shortfall is at zero, or some manageable number, mm -hmm. is that, that's when we can reconsider that? that? I would say we could, um, of okay. course. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe, we, maybe the answer is we shouldn't, but. Well, but. It, considering all other moving parts to the entire budget. I mean, it's always gonna be up for discussion, considering all those other moving parts. Okay. Um, I, it, quite frankly, I think this is something that you know we should be mindful of every year anyway, in terms of our spending plans and adding to whatever has been approved. Um, like I said, the form gives us the mechanism to be able to go through that discussion and a vetting process. Is, is there any way actually in the budget that we would capture or at least be able to calculate that um, we were able to save this much because we enacted the budget freeze, or it, we're not going to be able to know that because we won't even see yeah. the, requ the request. Because well, the request and not only that, there are so many different buckets of line items in the budget that it, to, to capture what's attributed from this um, would be very difficult. Okay. 
do, are there any budget categories? A few mo a few we meetings ago, we talked about, and we, we, we wanted to kind of understand a little bit more about specific budget categories. <coughs> I think it was a 5,000 series or something like that. Mm -hmm. do, does this budget, does this expenditure freeze focus on any particular categories, or are they just, or are they just, I mean, I, I saw the list, mm -hmm. the list that's in the, in the item, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't know if that necessarily mapped to any specific object code, or were those just discretionary classes that you felt? I would say they are groups of object expenditures. Okay, um, gotcha. For us, it would also, it would of, of course be a relief to our budget if it's something, if what we're saving is in the unrestricted general fund, mm -hmm. or a program that's not, that, that, that the general fund's not making contribution to, because okay. those are their direct hit. Those are a direct hit to our bottom line, to our um, ending balance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> may I have a motion and a second to approve the proposed expenditure freeze for fiscal year 2018-19? So moved. Second. Discussion? None. Roll call, please. Martinez. Aye. Romero. Aye. Nishihira. Aye. Canlis. Aye. Kaur. Aye. Chima. Aye. Okay, agenda item number 11, 11.1, 11 uh, I think we're going to go together, yeah. Are there any questions, uh, clarifications, or items that you would like pulled for the separation vote, separate vote? None for me. Uh, I just want to make comment on 11.1, .1 and also um, perhaps we could read 11.7, allowed uh, for people to hear and uh, you took out 11.10 so I was going to say something about that but you took that one out and uh, for 11.11 .11, a comment okay you Ms. none for me yeah none for me 11.1 um, .1, can you start Liz? yeah I on, um, on my uh, on the minutes um, my comment the sixth bullet I think I wasn't clear when I was explaining I I, I just wanted to say that um, we want to invite people to become part of the discussions regarding budget before Sacramento makes the budget for us. It, it's just a, I, I don't think I explained it correctly last time. Does that make sense, Ms. Valdez? The one you're talking about, the CSBA advocacy advocacy. Right, advocacy. right, right. Is that okay? All right. Actually, since you're on, since you're on the meetings, uh, the the meeting minutes, um, I think that there was during the, um, I was actually quoted as saying, um, oh, actually, uh, one of the things that I wanted to kind of clarify was that I find the the hypo the 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 theory about housing price or housing prices having a direct impact on student enrollment um, to be I think incomplete is what I was saying so um, I what I can do is I'll just send you an email clarifying specifically what how I'd like it to read in the in the in the minutes and then that's it thank you thank you so 11.7 yeah um, does anybody want to read this out loud or do you want to take turns because I but I think it needs to be read no matter what we do 11.7 um, uh, it's, it's the one on the hate, um, the hate mm -hmm. week right Bay yeah. Area United against hate week yeah I don't have my glasses otherwise I would like to run <laughs> today I'm M skip. Mr. Smith would you like to read this loud for <laughs> all of us sure and uh, uh, resolution number 011-1819 Bay Area United Against Hate Week November 11th through 17, 2018. Whereas the United States is a nation of immigrants whose strength comes from its diversity and whereas the Constitution enshrines quality on all individuals, equality on all individuals, regardless of race, gender, orientation, religion, or political views, and whereas recent policies and rhetoric have generated a toxic environment that encourages the propagation of racist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, sexist, homophobic, Islam, Islamophobia, 
and other negative views by emboldened hate groups and individuals. And whereas deep divisions within our country are a result of extreme ideology further strengthening a cycle of mistrust and suspicion, suspicion fueled by fear, anxiety, and insecurity. And whereas the New Haven Unified School District is dedicated to preventing and, and opposing hate and intolerance in our schools and community, and whereas the New Haven Unified School District Board of Education and staff firmly believe all means all, and whereas education, compassion, and cooperation are key to unlocking understanding and embracing differences between people, and whereas schools in New Haven Unified School District will be participating in activities during the week of November 11th to 17 to encourage and promote unity, tolerance, compassion toward all, especially the most vulnerable and victims of hate and bigotry. And whereas we believe in justice and equality and combating hate and bigotry in our communities, and whereas we seek to join other Bay Area communities in the United Against Hate Week as an important step in bridging divisions and strengthening our communities. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the New Haven Unified School District declares its support of the Bay Area United Against Hate Week activities in our communities November 11, 2018 through November 17, 2018, and each and every day beyond. Thank you. Thank you. 11.11? Uh, .11. Yeah, um, these are the policies um, that, that comprise a few pages. I just want to make sure that everyone understood that the only changes that happen in these are the ones in the bold, uh, because it consists of how many pages? Six or seven pages, but the only changes are the ones in the bold. It's not the entire thing. CSBA, um, I'm not quite explained that. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items 11.1 .1 through 11.21, except 11. Point, which one was that? 10. 10. 11. Except 10. 11. Point 10. Uh, can you have a motion, please? So moved. Second. A discussion? None. A roll call, please. Martinez. Aye. Romero. Aye. Nishihira. Aye. Canlis. Aye. Kaur. Aye. Chima. Aye. No further e um, items on the agendas. This meeting is. <coughs>